Yeah, I don't think you fully process it in the moment. It takes a little while. You know, I'd wake up at three in the morning crying and uh, thinking about, you know, my kids growing up without a dad or um, my wife being a widow. Um, and uh, that was one that hit me the most and was the toughest. Um, so that was that was jarring. So I'm in my late 40s. Uh, I live in the suburbs of New York City with my wife and three children. Um, I've been married to my wife for 18 years, known her for 23. She's been a rock during this period. In terms of hobbies, I like reading, I like traveling. I've been to over 35 countries. Um, and I, I used to enjoy working out. I'm doing less of that than I, than I was, but I hope to get back to it. What was it that you first started to feel that indicated something was wrong that got you to go to the doctor? I felt severe pain in my shoulder. It was excruciating. And after about three or four days, I made an appointment with an uh, orthopedic surgeon, an orthopod, to look at it. And he took an x-ray and he diagnosed rotator cuff tendinitis and uh, prescribed a steroid and physical therapy. And uh, I took the steroid and it flared the pain down uh, as steroids tend to do. And it enabled me to go on vacation uh, for a week. And I came back and a little while later, I started the physical therapy and I noticed a lump under my armpit, a modest sized lump, but I didn't think that much of it. And then I went to physical therapy and about the third session I was doing an exercise where I had my armpit sort of showing to the physical therapist and she felt it and said, what's this? And I said, I don't know, it's been there for a little while. And she said, you better get it checked out. And so I made an appointment for three weeks later and uh, with, my, with my general practitioner, uh, my primary care doctor. And I thought about it and I said, maybe three weeks is too late. And I called back and I got an appointment the next day and she checked it out. I, I think I said, I believe this could be something serious. I don't know if it's something serious, but I'd like to get it checked out sooner rather than later, and it's getting bigger. Yeah, I had an old, well, she looked at it at first and thought it was a cyst and said, but I think we should do an ultrasound to make sure it's nothing more nefarious. And I told you that that phrase stuck in my mind. Uh, it just, the word nefarious just creeps me every time I hear it now. Uh, and we did the ultrasound and it showed it wasn't a cyst. And then that, precipitated a, a litany of tests. Um, there was a CAT scan, there was an MRI, there was a PET scan, there was a lymph node biopsy, there was a bone marrow biopsy, um, all the sort of traditional tests that are done. And I think it was the lymph node biopsy that solidified for sure the diagnosis, but they, they suspected it after the MRI. I think we did a PET scan also, which showed that the lymphoma had spread uh, above and below the diaphragm and to the left and right sides of the chest. So it was staged at stage four. Um, I would advise anyone who's having a bone marrow biopsy that it's painful and that if you can do it under sedation, I had two of them, one under sedation, one not under sedation. And the one under sedation was much more pleasant. When, if you could bring us back to the moment where were you? How did you find out about the diagnosis? Was anyone with you? And um, yeah, just how you were able to, were you able to process it then? Like what was going on for you in that moment? Yeah, I don't think you fully process it in the moment. It takes a little while. Uh, I think I found out over the phone. Uh, my wife was out, but came home about 30 minutes later. And we sat at the kitchen table. The kids were at school and uh, we just, talked and cried and, um, you know, said we'd get through it together. But it was, stage four was scary. And and I read a little bit about how stage four is different than it would be for breast cancer or pancreatic cancer or something like that. Um, but it was, it took, it was a tough period 
between when I got the diagnosis and when I started the chemotherapy. Um, it was tough physically. Uh, my I had a six centimeter mass underneath my armpit and I it was hurting. And I would go around with ice packs under my armpit, which sort of seemed ridiculous, but it gave me relief. So physically I was in bad shape and I was not strong and I was tired. And, uh, and then mentally it just, it was hard not to be doing anything about it for that. And it was about two or three weeks before we got the chemotherapy going. And once the chemotherapy started, the art shop, I felt like at least something was happening that would, you know, fight the cancer. Can you talk to us about your decision-making in terms of where to go for treatment and what that was like? Um, so like you said, I started at a regional medical center and that's where my primary care physician was. And it's a perfectly acceptable place. I mean, there are good doctors there and it's it's a reasonable option. Um, but I'm lucky to live in the suburbs of New York where there's top-notch, you know, best-in-class hospitals for cancer and places for cancer. And we have a friend who is a nurse at Sloan Kettering who suggested that I look into Sloan Kettering. And it's not always easy to get in there. She pulled a few strings and helped us get in there. Um, and I was pretty far down the road. They were going to start chemotherapy at the regional medical center and they kept calling me to put a port in. And, uh, I kept delaying it and delaying it because I knew I wanted to get into Sloan Kettering. Um, and I'd had the, 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 uh, lymph node biopsy at the regional medical center, but I think it's important for someone to keep in mind that even if you're a little down the road, that it's better to switch to, if you have the opportunity to switch to a world-class place, that you go to the best place you can. Because if this had been a straightforward, plain vanilla case, I think the regional medical center would have been fine. I would have done the art shop. It would have put me in remission and I would have stayed in remission and they could have handled that. But as we'll talk about, there were a lot of twists and turns and that was fortuitous to go to a world-class place to handle those twists and turns. Talk to us about going going through our shop, what that was like. It's obviously a lot of chemo. Yeah, it's funny. I didn't find the art shop as bad as most people seem to find it. Um, I tolerated it, and we'll get into where I didn't tolerate chemotherapy later, but um, I tolerated it pretty well. I felt well enough. I, I, if I had chemotherapy starting at 9 o'clock and was done by 2.30 or something, I felt well enough to come home and work from home. Uh, I felt well enough that day to go take a walk. Um, and even cumulatively, they say it gets worse after the third or fourth I didn't really feel it that much. So I was on the lucky side originally. I did experience the hair loss. Um, after the second cycle, I was shedding hair in the shower and in the pillow. And I just said the hell with it, I'm gonna shave it off. Yeah, so I will say symbolically, every time I looked in the mirror, it was a stark reminder that I had cancer. So I didn't really care about it cosmetically a whole hell of a lot. But it was a it was a reminder that you're a cancer patient, and it has. I've lost my hair now three times, uh, and grew it back, and it's starting to grow back again. Um, and uh, I never cared a lot about it cosmetically, but every time it's fallen out, it's been a reminder that I'm going through chemotherapy and that I'm afflicted with cancer. Uh, in terms of what we told the kids, we were pretty straight up with them. Uh, after I got the diagnosis that I was going to lose my hair, that I'm having chemotherapy, but that the chances of a complete recovery uh, and, and long-term remission are good. We didn't get deep into statistics, but we said very likely. We didn't dwell on you know, percentages that you don't make it or that you do get cured or, or recurrence or you know five-year survival rates or any of that, but we just said it's it's not one of these cancers where you're doomed. And uh, we continue to be honest. So, so Jonathan, you go through our chop, um, the, the midway scan, it showed no evidence of disease. Um, first of all, how, how did you, I mean, what was it like during that time? I mean, there, you know, did you have scan anxiety as they call it, you know, getting the scan and kind of waiting for, gosh, is this working or is this not working? Yeah, I did. I mean, it seemed like it would take a day or two for the radiologist to read out the PET scan. 
um, which was, I remember one time I had it on a Friday and it didn't come back until a Tuesday, which was definitely scanxiety over the weekend. Um, but, you know, you just tried to occupy your, your mind with other things. And, uh, but every time I have a scan, I'm nervous. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're going to fast forward now to, so it's mid-May and you started getting bad headaches at night. Can you describe what those were like? Yeah, it had been about six weeks since I got the all clear on the final scan from the r -chop. And we had gone out and celebrated with friends who had been supportive of us. Um, and I started getting headaches in mid-May that were pretty bad and mostly at night. And uh, I told someone, it, it, you know, I, it felt like, not that I drank a 12 pack, but it felt like I drank a 12 pack and had a massive hangover the next day. And uh, and then I thought my room was dry and maybe it was dehydration. And uh, so that continued for about two or three weeks. And then they started getting worse. And then in, I guess it was early, the 1st of June or the 31st of May, I uh, I started getting nauseous and vomiting and couldn't get out of bed for like 18 hours. And I had known the signs of CNS lymphoma, lymphoma in the nervous system and brain, spine and brain. And I had even had prophylactic treatment for that called intrathecal methotrexate, where they give you a uh, spinal tap and put in some methotrexate to try to prevent it from entering the central nervous system. So I knew the signs of it entering the central nervous system. Uh, and I called up the doctor and she said, come in. And they did a scan and they found a four centimeter mass in the brain that was sort of pushing on the rest of the brain, which was causing the headaches, edema. Um, and they sent me, I, Sloan Kettering has regional outposts within the New York metro area, which I'd gone to for most of my treatment. Uh, and they sent me immediately by ambulance to the main hospital in Manhattan. You know, do not pass go. My wife had 10 minutes to go home and pack a bag. Um, so it was pretty significant. It was pretty serious. That was clear. Jonathan, I can't imagine you had been, you'd already celebrated being no evidence of disease, you know, done with that chemo. You had tolerated it incredibly well. When it when it was apparent to you after the MRI um, that this was something related to the to the lymphoma that this was cancer. You know what? Where were you at? You know, mentally and emotionally at that point. Yeah, I do remember being in the ambulance. Uh, I don't think the full gravity of it hit me for, for twenty four hours. Um, but it was it was probably emotionally the hardest up until recently, the hardest time I'd had with cancer because I knew the statistics on CN, secondary CNS lymphoma and I knew that they weren't great. And that's the time I would keep a good game face. And then later on at, between methotrexate chemotherapy treatments, you know, I'd wake up at three in the morning crying and uh thinking about you know my kids growing up without a dad or um my wife being a widow um and uh that was when it hit me the most and was the toughest um so that was that was jarring but i would say to people you know you can read the probabilities that you have a 72 percent chance of surviving or whatever uh, but you're a sample of one and you have a different case than other people and you have different pre-existing conditions and you have different temperament and you have different nutrition and, you know, you're, you're a sample of one. And so, and, and a cancer patient told me this, don't get too fixated on the probabilities. I mean, if they say you have a 1% chance of making it, you should be scared, but 50, 50, you know, what are you going to do? So I appreciate you you know, framing it in that way, um, in the way that you, you thought about it. And so you, you get transferred, um, Jonathan to the main hospital in Manhattan for Sloan Kettering. And what was the conversation at that point? So, I mean, it was pretty early on that the game plan was created to do four 
rounds of high dose methotrexate chemotherapy, and then try to transition if that worked to a stem cell transplant. And there were all kinds of twists between the methotrexate and the stem cell transplant. But that was the game plan from the very early days. Methotrexate chemotherapy, for those who aren't aware, is you get infused with methotrexate, which looks toxic and is toxic. And then you have to excrete it from your body and stay an inpatient in the hospital and literally sort of urinate it out uh, over three or four days. Some people it takes six days and they don't let you go home until your blood levels of methotrexate hit a certain threshold. So it was administered via IV um, and they took your blood levels to make sure you could tolerate it. Um, and I had four times and I was on the neurology floor uh, in the hospital, and which was interesting because I had roommates who had brain tumors that were really affecting their behavior. I was very fortunate in that this four centimeter mass seemed to be in an area that wasn't mission critical to your behavior or your mental acuity or whatever. Wow. So you, yeah, you were in the thick of things. Um, and I guess you're dealing with a lot as it is, Jonathan, being in that sort of environment. I mean, how were you able to, you know, keep it going, keep it moving? Yeah, it was enough post COVID. Um, I could have, I think one visitor at a time, two visitors a day. Um, my wife came almost every day during that period. She was very supportive. I had friends who came the day she wasn't coming or, you know, late in the afternoon if she had to go home. Um, so friends kept me going and sort of humor kept me going. You know, if, if you could laugh or cry and I sort of chose to laugh. Um, and that, I think that's important. Not that you don't, like I said, you have your moments where you, you cry, but, um, humor is very important to me in dealing with cancer because otherwise it's just overwhelming and maybe it's a defense mechanism, but it helped. You know, what is the importance of allowing oneself to do that, to go to these different places? I think it allows you to be honest with yourself. Um, it, if you ignore it, you've repressed something and it sort of crops up anyway. So I think, you know, you got to be intellectually honest about the fact that you may not make it, um, but not dwell on that fact. And you, you want to plan for the worst and hope for the best. So, um, so I know that, that again, you had twists and turns and one of the twists was that, okay, yes, this might, this chemo, this methotrexate may clear the way to get a stem cell, a stem cell transplant. Uh, there ended up being delays, right? Talk us, talk to us about what ended up happening as a result. Yeah. So I finished the methotrexate. It look, we got a scan that showed the brain was clear. Uh, the doctor wanted to do another scan to show that the brain was all clear because it had been seven or eight weeks at that point, And they had a threshold of how long they'll keep the old scan valid for. And that scan showed three spots in the brain where there was still disease that were new spots. And so I had to go get two more rounds of high dose methotrexate, two weeks apart. The worst part was getting that first scan back that showed after the seven or eight week delay that the, the lymphoma had come back in the brain because it was literally the day before I was scheduled to go in for the stem cell transplant. So I had mentally gotten myself ready for a month in the hospital. I had started packing a bag. I did, you know, you have to get yourself where you're sort of girded for high dose chemotherapy and being pretty sick. And, and then to have that recurrence was just demoralizing. Um, so that was the hardest. I think over time, my mental state got better, but I was pretty bummed for the first three or four days after that, that scan. Oh, well, yeah, of course. Like, you know, not, I think anybody would be, um, and you had had to digest so many rounds of bad news or complicated news. Um, and so you did end up 
getting to to go yeah into the stem cell transplant and aut autologous meaning your own um can you talk to us about what that was like in the hospital and the whole process of it yeah i was there for about a month uh a little less 23 24 days right when you got in there the first day they gave you chemotherapy and i had three days of chemotherapy followed by three days of rest and i wasn't in too bad a shape at that point then the seventh day i think it was the seventh day is called your rebirth day, which is where they put the stem cells back. And they had collected my stem cells in early August. And meanwhile, we're now at the end of November. That's how long it had been delayed. But thank God the stem cells are good for like five years. And so they put the stem cells back in. And, uh, and then the next few days, you're okay. And then after that, you begin to get very weak uh, and nauseous at times. And your white blood cell count drops to less than 0 0.1, which normal is 4 to 11. Um, and your platelet count drops so that, like, you can't shave. Um, and I had the added complication. I had the rhinovirus, which is basically the common cold. But I had a very bad cough through all four weeks of the stem cell transplant, which made something that was difficult in the first place even more difficult because it would keep me up at night. And it was just, it, it was an added complication that wasn't needed. It just underscores what a long process it's been. And I guess I would say to anyone out there who's first diagnosed, you just got to take it as it comes because you think, at least I thought I knew how it was going to go. And, uh, and it just cold, hard reality smacks you in the face. And you might get lucky and have, I have a good friend who had our chop and it was, six sessions and then it was good and he's been cancer free for 10 years so it can go swimmingly um or you can have a lot of twists and turns like i do i don't know i've i've sort of gone through it in my mind a lot so it's not jarring to sort of go through it verbally um but it's it's been one thing after the next i i i'm just thankful that i've made it so far after all these twists and turns so I'm thankful for every day I didn't used to be, uh, or I took things for granted. Uh, I know that's a common sort of cliche after a cancer fight. Um, but uh, I, I guess I've just learned to realize that you don't control as much as you think you control. I mean, you control how you react to it. And so, so as we shift into this most recent sort of situation, you ended up back in the hospital. Um, your recovery time at home from the stem cell transplant cut short. What happened? What were you feeling that that got you back in the hospital? And if you could describe what happened then. Yeah, so I came home mid-December of 2022, so a few months ago. Um, the first week I was very weak and sort of just getting my sea legs under me. Um the second week I was doing better. And then the third week I started regressing. And when I would walk up the steps, I would be short of breath, very short of breath. And it became apparent that something was not going as well as it should. And uh, we had a pulse oximeter at home, which you can buy for about you know $15 for a good one. We took the pulse ox and it read 93 and then it dropped to 91. It's a measure of oxygen saturation and how much oxygen is getting in your blood. Um, and anything below 95 is troubling and sort of below 90 is really troubling. And I called the doctor and I said, I don't think this is a big deal, but it's dropping down to 91. He said, get to the clinic, the sort of regional satellite Sloan Kettering clinic right away. And they gave me some oxygen and took a chest X-ray and saw inflammation in the chest sort of pneumonia-like inflammation. And it was a sec it was like deja vu all over again. And then it got to the point where it dropped so much that they had to put me on a ventilator, intubate me, sedate me, and put me on a ventilator. And uh, it, they weren't sure I was going to make it. I mean, my wife brought the kids in to say goodbye. Um, and I don't remember it because you get sort of amnesia from the period before the sedation, like the 16 hours or whatever before the sedation is given. Um, and I was on a ventilator for eight days. 
and came off it and started breathing on my own. And what I didn't realize and now do is that you get very weak if you've been on a ventilator for eight days, your body doesn't move basically. And they do what's called prone you, which is put you on your stomach. And uh, you can get all kinds of bed sore type sores and your muscle mass declines by about 2% every day that you're on a ventilator. And it doesn't sound like a lot to lose 16% of your muscle mass, but I couldn't walk when I came off it. So Jonathan, walk us through now from that point. So you recover, finished recovering in the main part of the hospital. And then what happens next? What's happened between then and now? Again, I couldn't walk when I first got done with the ventilator. And a week or two later, I was still bedridden. And when I got in the main part of the hospital, they started doing physical therapy and I started walking. And literally at the beginning, it was like hard to walk from my bed to the bathroom in the hospital room. But slowly but surely, it improved. Uh, I've since graduated to a cane. I have a cane. And I think within a month or two, I'll be able to walk, you know, half a mile to a mile without any sort of balancing device. Um, I don't I, you know, I'd like to do a 5K by the end of the year. That's sort of a aspiration or a goal um i don't care what the time is but uh and my appetite hasn't been quite what it was um so it's still a recovery i get winded you know walking up the steps my my sort of stamina is not good but getting better I imagine there's an element of having to really be patient i don't know how patient you have been in your life um you know, overall, but this kind of recovery is lots of work and it's slow going. I mean, it really has to be one, one foot in front of the other, right? So how much has it been a test of patience? Um, it's been a test of patience, um, but I was impatient in the hospital. I had been in there so much. What is the, what is, how often are you following up now with your, with your doctor and what is the plan? Um, I'm following up about once a week with labs and we've done a mix of telemedicine visits uh and in-person visits i don't know how long we'll keep going once a week for uh eventually it'll be once every three weeks or two weeks you know it'll just depend on and i have a scan in early march which it's almost march now um to see whether the stem cell is working and it, it won't mean it's worked because we'll need five or ten years of scans that don't show anything to know that it's worked, but at least hopefully it will have worked for three months. I've learned to temper my expectations, um, but you're always hoping for the best and it's still a blow if something, you know, if this scan isn't positive, well, isn't a good result, I shouldn't say positive, um, isn't a good result, it will be a huge blow. So um, you try not to get ahead of yourself and, so like I said, I, I don't think you take it one day at a time, but at this point I take it one week at a time. And uh, I've got enough to do with physical therapy and just getting my strength back. And Any last thing you want to share, Jonathan? I, I appreciate everything you shared already. You know, my mistake to the extent I made one was thinking that I would know how it all would go at the beginning. And I think you've got to realize that this can be different than what you expect and therefore you probably shouldn't have both well, keep your expectations in check but also don't have too many of them um and uh that doesn't mean you're not fighting i think anytime you have a experience that highlights your own mortality uh particularly at a not young but at sort of a much younger age than you would expect to be grappling with it uh you want to examine your life and I've started to, I haven't come to any conclusions, but you just want to make sure you're spending your days doing what you want to do, um, spending it with the people you want to spend it with and who want to spend it with you. Um, and not that you can't waste an hour, but just make the most out of every day. Um, and uh, it'd be a shame to let this experience go and do everything exactly the same as before.